What's up? This is Jason Bothe, a.k.a. Rene Rene. You're listening to the, the oh shit, the not skateboarding podcast. The <laughs> sk- snow, snow, snow skate. Uh, I never learned a snow skate podcast. Oh no, the podcast for snow. Uh, the, I'm not snow. Uh, skating is not snowboarding. Well, uh, anyways, enjoy. Welcome to the Not Snowboarding Podcast. A delightfully tasteful glimpse into the other side of snowboarding. <laughs> Welcome to the Not Snowboarding Podcast, episode number 15. I'm your host, Nate Musan. The whole deal with this podcast is to bring you, each week, a long-form conversation with someone from the snowboarding industry about topics other than snowboarding. Sure, we'll chat about snowboarding from time to time, but I'm looking to dig deeper and focus on the business ventures, health and wellness aspects, diet and exercise regimens, and altruistic initiatives. I'm doing this in part to satisfy my own curiosity about what makes people in this industry tick, and selfishly to learn more about life, gain takeaways from others' experiences, and be able to share it all with you via this podcasting medium. The conversation with today's guest, Jason Bothe, hits on all of the previous points as he's a self-described renaissance man of sorts. Jason's a marketing person, a hype man, an artist, a painter that likes to act, and many of you know him as Rene Rene. I was pawing through my DC Mountain Lab book and came across the following description. Who is Rene Rene? He's the one guy with a number of characters and aliases. He's a musician, a poet, a painter, and a cowboy. He's an 80s skier or even a Texas oil developer. But most importantly, he's a person who walks in the door and lights up an area with fun and excitement. A native Canadian who grew up skateboarding, snowboarding, and doing artwork, and hanging with friends. He's a musician, recording artist. His paintings are sought after. He designs clothing. He's DJed in Vancouver, Thailand, and LA. He's appearing in TV pilots. He's an all-around renaissance guy. And whatever he's doing, people love to be a part of it. Rene got a Michael Jackson singing microphone when he was six, and he's been singing ever since. In addition to singing for Backlip, a band with Danny Way, he and Danny are working on an acoustic project, described as Simon and Garfunkel-ish, called Rene and Way. Rene is also working on a solo CD called White Heat that's an electro-hip-hop style jambalaya. For a sample, look no further than this DVD, which contains the songs Driving and Sexcapades. It's impossible to accurately describe Rene Rene, How could you sum up a guy with that many personalities? But he has become an urban legend of sorts, and anyone fortunate enough to spend some time with him has been on the receiving side of his aim to amuse. Rene Rene's style is far from highbrow. It's downright tasteless at times. But he's got a witty, smart approach to life that is infectious. Spend a little time with Rene Rene, and you'll understand what so many of us have been fortunate enough to witness. Just be ready for the unexpected, because you won't see the same person twice, and your stomach will hurt with laughter. I think that description scrapes the surface of Rene Rene. Let's jump into the chat that AJ and I had with Jason to find out more. Oh, dude, it was so, like, I was, I would have a, a, a coffee and go to sleep. Oh, yeah. It would knock me out. Like, and it's so funny. Like, people are like, how can you have a coffee before bed? I'm like, fuck, this coffee will put me to sleep, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Do you notice any any difference? And I know you're doing it in, in combination with a diet, but just in general feeling? Are, are you feeling, like, less stressed? Oh, yeah. I, I feel like I have way more clarity. I, th- I feel like uh, sometimes the coffee would be good for – because I would have to keep drinking it to kind of keep, uh, you know, like up – uh, on top of it, so now it's like I'm I'm pr- I'm drinking a lot of tea though, just because uh, there's like at work they they brew it in a big thing, and I just kind of fill it up all morning. But I find teas like a little it's 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 actually more it's it's got more caffeine to be honest. I feel. I, I guess it depends on on the tea. I've been mixing it up with. Um... Uh, a Tulsi tea, which is like an Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic tea. They call it like holy basil. And it has this uh, adaptogen, which gives you like this smooth, very organic energy, like a non-caffeinated uh, energy. It's almost just like 
that day you can look back to when you were really young and you just like everything felt good. It kind of makes you feel like that. Nice. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm off sugar and I feel like sugar and bread and all this stuff that I've cut out of my diet, I've been eating a lot of raw food. It's like um, that probably has more to do with my, my kind of focus than uh, the coffee or tea. I think just my the whole diet change. Like today I had, shoot, some crazy raw. It was funny because I'm in this vegan restaurant. And I'm like, oh, they're sour cream because I'm so anal about cheese and milk. And they're like, uh, no, uh, we're vegan. There's no dairy. I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I just see sour cream. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. I can't eat this. Like I go to restaurants and it's just like, okay, uh, I can't eat here. You guys can eat. But uh, I'm, you know, uh, brown, I'm, brown rice, like it's like no one has brown rice these days. It's crazy. Now I'm vegan too, so I'm I'm you know very aware of all those little like faux foods. And from a health perspective, you've really got to watch out for some of those. Even the the soy based ones, they'll be like chock full of like sodium and other preservatives, and they're they're like transition foods, you know, for people that are have just decided that they're going to be vegan or vegetarian. Uh, they still want to look at some food that was like what they were eating before, so they want something in the shape of a hot dog or a hamburger, or they want their like you said, sour cream. Um, but it's really no, I mean, maybe you can make the argument that it's better in some ways, but from a health perspective, probably not. Well, yeah, this was like, so like made over to cashews or I, I, I have no idea. It did not taste like sour cream. <laughs> <laughs> what, what sparked the diet change? Uh, I was just, I'm overweight. I was like, just good living, I guess. And just kind of not, <laughs> A lot of uh, executive lunches and <laughs> just eating out a lot. And well, my wife's an she's the awesome cook, but it's I wouldn't say it's like of the healthy variety. You know, she'll she and she'll make food, and it'll be like, you know, oh, we need sides, we need this, and I'm just like, oh man, I'm good with just like pasta and salad, but she'll make like, you know, three other side dishes. I'm just like, oh man, it's just. Not that I, you know, I shouldn't complain, but it's just at a point I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta stop eating so much. Well, yeah, if it's there and easily accessible, you'll eat it. Is it, is it like when I was growing up for the kids? And I know you have a couple of kids, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it like a uh, land grab for food, or, or is there plenty of food for them to, uh, to kind of do their thing? Yeah, no, they, they. I mean, they're so picky, you know. And, and they're just, oh, grilled cheese or something. They're, you know, it's, I mean, not picky, but just they don't, they used to eat a lot more vegetable. My, my daughter eats, she, she goes pretty, she, she eats. My, my middle son, he's the one that just kind of like pasta and the basic, you know, carbs and, and whatnot. He'll eat, you know, depends the kind of vegetables and stuff. But I try, I mean, I don't even eat at home pretty much with my new diet. I mean, I have like raw, almonds and cashews but a lot of the meal well no my wife makes some she makes like spaghetti out of zucchini now oh yeah i've had that it's like some pesto sauce i really like that i've always loved salads but yeah it's kind of uh yeah it's a it's a whole new program but i've lo i mean i don't even i it was weird because i didn't weigh myself i knew i was way overweight and uh I weighed myself. We did. I do a podcast as well, and we. I weighed myself. I was two hundred and twenty-four pounds, <laughs> but I'm six three, so it's like you know, it's not like that super overweight. It's just uh, I don't know what I was before because I probably lost about twelve pounds before I weighed myself. So I want to say I was almost like two forty Gordy or something, but that's which is scary. Right, right, right. Definitely feeling a little bit more solid on the uh, skateboard and the snowboard at that weight. Well. Plus, being back in Canada, I feel like winter, I'm, I'm, I eat more. You're inside more, you know what I mean? Like, living in California, it's like, you're, you're, it's, it's continuous summer, so I'm always surfing or always the sun also, and I don't know, I forget to eat or something. Up here, you don't. I think it's the beer, though, because I, I feel like my Canadian brethren, we drink, they drink so much beer up here. It's just kind of constant. <laughs> and when <laughs> Nothing you against it, but now... That helped uh, add to the, the, the weight gain and, and all that stuff. So. For sure. And when you said exec, executive lunch, that's what an executive lunch is, right? Yes. Yes. Would be would be drinks and, and, and uh, food and, 
you know, and I mean, nice, really nice restaurants and stuff. It's not like I'm not, I'm not eating super bad. It's just I'm just eating a lot, lots of good food. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now I'm, I'm, you know, I eat a lot, but it's just all super healthy for me. So let's, um, let's go back to kind of how you transitioned from, uh, uh, I don't know, want to, want to say being, being in Canada, but, uh, how you transitioned from, you know, being a Canadian and to, to California, like you mentioned before, and then back up to, uh, present day with the, uh, with the podcast, basically take us back to a time, um, shortly bo- before Rene Rene was born. Mm. I mean, Rene Rene was born in Canada, in Vancouver, um, I've always been uh, a part of like the skateboard and, and, and snowboard scene in, in, in BC and in Vancouver and Whistler and stuff. Um, I mean, I was in the first whiskey movie. Uh, and before that, I was actually in a movie that uh, my friend Murray Seipel made, I think, in the 80s or late, late 80s, possibly, or 90s. And that kind of, I've always, and I've always, uh, I've always been a character. I've always like created different characters. So I had a, a, you know, multiple, um, there was this guy, Roy Schneider, who was like a a longboard European longboard champion. And another guy who was the Boris, who was a mechanic. And, and even, you know, as long as I remember, even in high school, I always was, was, you know, first day of school at this new school in Vancouver, I wore a wig and dressed up like Spicoli (laughs) and everyone for like a week. Everyone was just like thought I was like the California skater kid, and then the next week I just went to school normal, and everyone's like, "Who the fuck are you?" <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I always I always kind of did these different characters, and and so Slam City was around. I'd always been uh, been involved with that. Um, the the year before Renee Renee was born, um, I did this. I was I was shooting a movie, um, independent movie called Four Twenty, where I played this this uh, biker drug dealer named Graham Dorigo and he you know was like just a total typical um you know douchebag biker drug dealer kind of kind of character and so I I was filming it but but my friend um Mike Pragnell who who uh, was doing this thing called Skate Canada he had asked me to come and film for him at Slam City Jam which in Slam City Jam was was the you know a huge um, world championship of skateboarding that they had in Vancouver, Vert and, and Street, and you know it was pretty amazing. It, it, I don't, I don't know how long it went. Almost twenty years, it felt like. Um, so I went to that and I filmed on the course as this biker dude, and kind of you know was in the mix. And half the guys, you know, some a lot of the skaters knew me, and then some of them were like, "Who the fuck is that guy?" And then from there, Graham kind of you know over that year um, morphed from this biker to all of a sudden, you know, Graham got into listening to Ice-T, you know, and started started (laughs) becoming kind of a rapper. And so, uh, you know, I was at this party, and this is like maybe a week before Slam City, and and, uh, and, uh, he also started wearing neon and and started, you know, getting, like just, you know, he was into hip-hop or into rap music and Ice-T and and whatnot. So I was at a party, and a friend of mine was like – you know who who's this character like this isn't uh this isn't Graham anymore like who you've kind of morphed and i had i had these rattle i had like uh extensions like uh braid extensions and so my whole thing was like i'm like a rattlesnake you hear me coming kind of thing you like you hear the rattle <laughs> it's like you know sweetness is on the horizon and so i was thinking to myself at the time too like skateboarding um had kind of uh just become like I hate saying the term, but back then it was okay, gay, like not cool and, and lame and not, not, not uh, you know, nowadays we're not allowed to say that term. But, you know, in all honesty, that's what I was thinking, like skateboarding's gay, you know, right guard and all these, like the army was sponsoring the competition. Um, and so I was just kind of like, what's the gayest name a guy could have? And... I, and my friend asked me who this character was. So in my mind, I'm thinking this, like, oh, you know, who's a gay, what's a, what's a gay gay name? And I was like, <clears throat> I guess I said it out loud, but I thought I said it to myself. I was like, Renee. And I was like, and I said it back to him. I go, Renee. And he's like, Renee, Renee. And I'm like, Renee, Renee, two times gay. <laughs> and, and the way my logic was two, two gays made straight. 
<laughs> of course. Like, two, two, two Renees made a straight guy, right? And so uh, that was the whole logic. And then so the next week was Slam City Jam, and I showed up, and they're like, what's your name? I'm like, Renee, Renee. And just kind of he was born. And that was probably in 2000, 2000 yeah, nine, uh, yeah, 2000. When you get into a character like Rene Rene or one of the, the predecessors or anyone who's uh, uh, came, came since then, what's, are you almost like a character actor? Like the whole time you're in the garb, are you that character never breaking or, or how does, yeah, how does I mean, that work? It's, it's, it, you know, it depends, right? Like it's hard. It's really hard when um, – it's easy when you don't know people. It's easy when I'm around strangers and I'm in that character. But when I see people that know me as Jason, it's it's totally, you know, I kind of, I wouldn't say break character, but I'll give them winks and I'll kind of like, you know, um, you know, obviously they know it's me. And some people are, some people are cool with it and just kind of let it go. And other people are like, come on, you know, like whatever, trying to make me break. And I'll just smile or, or whatever and, and, and check with them. But I, I really try to... Uh, to, to live the character, you know, to really become it and, and embrace it. So there'll be times like, say, I'm shooting something. You know, we did a, we did a whiskey, uh, I think it was Whiskey 3, and I, I was this bum. And it's funny because I, I, I was trying to, I was doing art on the streets and was having, you know, no luck just trying to sell paint. Like people were doing it, natives would do carved masks and stuff. And so I figured out, you know, maybe I'll just, you know, I got time. I might as well just go paint on the street. So no one would give me the time of day. So so I was like, well, fuck it. You know, I'm just going to dress up like a bum, a homeless person, and sell my art and, and sell it. You just pay, do drawings on cardboard and make people feel sorry for me that they'll have to give me money, even though they're getting art. But it would, it would, you know, like some, and it was, it was more, it was almost like a, a social experiment to, to kind of like a social studies of, of, of how people treated, you know, a bum or a homeless person. And I did really well. And it was funny, all the Americans bought, like I'm, I, I sold all my art to all the Americans and then all the, the Canadian business people would be like, get a fucking life and even <laughs> loser. And, you know, it was just really, it was like eye opening how harsh people are. And, were you know, you... And, and and it's like here I am. I'm not bumming. I'm not asking for money. I'm I'm doing art and I'm trying to sell it to him. And were you so documenting anyways, this in any way? Was it being filmed from a distance? Or no, something? no, no, no. This was just this was this was just me doing that. And and so Sean Johnson comes along and and runs into me and he's like, "What? The, what are you doing?" <laughs> and I'm just like, Shh, "You're gonna blow my cover, dude!" <laughs> like you know, like. I, you know, I had to break break the silence and start talking to him. And he's like, "Dude, I'm, I'm we're shooting. Like, I want this character in the new whiskey movie." I'm just like, "100, percent let's do it." And actually, Mouse Mouse had come up and we, we shot with shot with Mouse. And yeah, it was funny. Like that character. You know, I literally got up. You know, for about a week, I did it before Johnson even saw me. And I would go outside, put dirt on my face. I had my arm in a sling. Like I, when I live live these characters, I really embrace it like go the full nine yards you know like kind of i guess apocalypse now like into the character right so uh yeah sometimes sometimes it's 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 you know with with renee in the early stages of renee it was like full of belief but then you know renee kind of got watered down a lot you know basically because of sponsorships and because of you know not wearing my own gear but wearing you know clothing that was you know companies that were paying me to wear their stuff so it kind of that kind of watered renee down the character and the personality was still there but the 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 look and the feel you know like he was the stuff that i was wearing you know was all vintage crazy neon 90s 80s that i've been collecting forever you know i i had a crazy tickle trunk of just like costumes and wigs and 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 what have you it's so funny you just even saying that it's almost like he's you're you're telling me a a pre-scripted story of him becoming a victim of his success like it's written it's i mean it almost it plays out like you planned it that way like oh yeah you know he's as he got older and he was successful the sponsorships were really you know dragging him away from his core self yeah, I mean that's that's kind of like that's that's their industry in a nutshell, almost, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of you know you get you get sucked into it. You know, I mean, I love you know my time at DC and and you know with 
stuff I'd done with Nixon and Oakley and stuff was, was awesome, you know, and I wouldn't, but it definitely, you know, watered that character down. And that character was like raw, like, you know, Rene, Rene was, you know, the first Slam City, I'm, I'm, you know, I had a bottle of scope that I was drinking, you know, like, and, and that was not because I wanted to drink scope, but that's because that character would drink scope and that character cursed and that character was like fucking just Richter, you know, like it's crazy, bad shit, crazy. And everyone, you know, and that's why like nowadays people are just like, man, like we thought you were crazy. And I'm like, good, that, perfect. And I did I'm a good actor because you believed it. Right. Yeah. But, you know, and I really, you know, would ham it up and, and overdo it. Just, just, you know, especially, and then people would be like, you know, start being like, is this guy for real? And then I would just even, you know, ham it up even more, you know, depending. I mean, and, and I really did, aff- I was affected by my surroundings and by what people thought. Like if people were, you know, you know, being kind of like trying to be funny or thinking like I'm so, I'm dumb or, you know, like it's going over my head. And then, then I would just totally toy with them and fuck with them and just kind of, you know, loop them in and and have them at the end of it just being like, huh, like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> like, did I just get fucking pawned right now? <laughs> like, well, this guy just owned me. Like, you, you fully succeeded from my point of view. I, I, I met you once briefly at the Mountain Lab. I was out there as a, a retailer do, giving some feedback on the, the new line of boots in like 2004, 2005, or something like that. And uh, one of the days that we were there, we didn't stay at the Mountain Lab, but we went there every day for like meetings. And one of the days we got to ride a little bit and you were on the snow and it was like you were a show and <laughs> I could not for the life of me believe that there was any person other than Rene Rene. Nice. I was there with another um, manager from my shop and he was like, he's, he was a skateboarder. So, yeah. you know, he wasn't quite as close to what was going on in, in snowboarding. He snowboarded a little bit, but, um, he was just like, what is going on with that guy? I was just like, that's Rene Rene. And like, well, and he, he was like, wanted to stay like probably 25 to 30 feet away from you at all times. He just wasn't <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh man, I was wild. And I was on my diet back then probably too, and drinking just tequila in a, in a water bottle. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Dude, I, I mean, I, those mountain lab days were so much fun. Like, I mean that, and that are, it was not only obviously the mountain lab itself was amazing. Um, but like Todd and, and Eddie and, and Dev and just like, you know, Bjorn and, and that, our crew was so sick, like such a cool, cool bunch of guys, you know? Um, was I mean, it? you can see like you watch the mountain lab and it's just, it makes you want to snowboard. Like it just, it's just fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was yeah, Pierre, Pierre Rickberg did such an amazing job. Uh, I, you know, I, I owe Pierre so much, you know, and I have nothing but love for that guy because, you know, I've, I grew up around s- snowboarding, like all my friends, you know, from Devon to, to, you know, the local San Salone, all these guys and Johnson and Kearns and, and all these people. And I mean, not saying I'm, I'm, I, I can snowboard. I'm not, I was never a ripper, but no one ever filmed me. No one, you know what I mean? Like my friends, you know, they wouldn't film me, even though I was doing, you know, doing a good trick or something sick. I just, it wasn't worth their while to film me in a sense. It wasn't, no one, no one cared necessarily about Jason Bothe. And then, you know, I go, I show up at the mountain lab and, 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 you know, as Renee and, and Pierre was just like, Pierre got it. And he was just like, this is awesome. Like, can I film you? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'd lo- you know, like this is I, I, my whole life. I wanted to pe- someone and, and not, not just for any, I think for my own personal, you know, to see myself snowboard on 16 millimeter. Are you kidding me? Like we, he was wasting film on me. That's, that's kind of how I thought of it. You know, like in a sense, like why you, you're film you're, you're burning, you know, 16 millimeter film on me doing half ass tricks that, you know, would never make it into a snowboard movie. And then he makes Mountain Lab and, and kind of, you know, I, I and I see what he does and I'm just like, wow, like, you know, I'm really honored to, to have, to be filmed by that guy and, and, and to be in those Mountain Lab movies because, you know, I really think he was, at the time, you know, snowboarding was so serious and this guy comes along and makes this just, you know, a video based around a tiny little 
house with a you know one rope toe and, and a bunch of features like it was pretty pretty amazing so yeah no pierre is pierre is amazing total visionary and and i thank him you know for shooting me because you know not only that but it turned into you know i did a renee renee you know snow line you know ken it was funny because ken was like he wanted to give me a colorway and then for some reason i he wore a pair of shoes i painted for him and the marketing director at the time's like, oh, who painted? What are those shoes? I'm like, oh, it's Renee's. And he's like, well, let's. Why don't we put that on a on a on a jacket? And and you know, from from a uh, a colorway onesie to to you know three jackets and snowboard boots and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it was kind of mind blowing. And you know, if, if it wasn't for for Pierre filming me, none of that would have happened. You know. Well, he definitely. You know, even if the even with the robot food movies just showcasing a different style around. like Travis Parker would be doing crazy shifties or carves or butters that weren't maybe necessarily the gnarliest trick that happened but were look so fun and he did oh. such a good job showing that so it, it to me it makes sense like your riding and your persona just looks like fun like when I saw that in the DC Mountain Lab video I was like hell yeah I want to go do that I want to wear neon it looks fun it's, it's a fashion <laughs> risk but it's like it's goofy and it's you know you're having a good time and snowboarding's that's what it's about you know I mean that and that, that's a, you know Renee Renee was like don't take yourself seriously How, you know like whoever has the most fun wins type of thing and Travis oh my god that guy what a like I mean that whole movie too like all the just the I, the hula hoops and and you know he's such a creative dude and he's so fun to be around and always you know I've never. In my life, you know, anytime he's always happy, <laughs> he's always like stoked, you know, and then it rubs off. It rubs off on everyone, and and he's just a just a, that guy, you know. I I wish him the most success out of anyone, and he's you know just kind of that attitude, the the kind of whatever, you know, have fun. It's not it's not it's not about selling the most amount of jackets or whatever. It's about you know stoking people out and and. You know, I'm I'm air blaster and all that stuff. Like when he even started it, I was like, you know, good luck. And and now I see it everywhere. I'm I'm like, that's so that's so rad that he's, he's it's still going and he's still doing it. So love that dude. Was there was there ever a conversation with Ken or anybody at DC like, hey, this is what I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna create this role. How? What was your employment well, so there? Was How was that negotiated? I, um, Brian Botts. I don't know if you you know who that is, but he was like the snow team manager at the time, and and I was down. Um, this is before. This is when I first moved down. So this is probably like two thousand and one, and um, I made music. So I I I, I put out like a, a a little underground CD that it kind of circulated within the skateboard community. Um, you know, everyone. I sent it up to Real and Deluxe in San Francisco and. All the DC guys were rocking it. Ryan Smith, obviously, who's who's a, who's a friend of mine, and I guess it got into the hands of Ken Block, and so we I was at um, an ASR or something, and there was a DC party, and Brian Botts approached me, and he's just like, "Man, you're Renee, Renee, yada yada. I want you know, I want you to introduce you to somebody." So he went and he introduced me to Ken. I had already known da- I, I I had met Damon before, um, and of course I'm friends with Danny. But uh, I'd never met Ken, and Ken was like, you know, fanning out. It was weird. Like, he was like, not fanning out, but he was like, he really loved the song Driving that I did. And he, he was kind of like, you know, super stoked. And, and just, it was interesting. He just, he wanted he wanted me to, to be involved with DC, and he wanted, you know, he just, I, I don't even remember what transpired. I just remember walking away like, wow, that was really cool, like, you know, and then I, I ended up getting went out to the mountain lab. I don't even think he knew I snow, snowboarded. I don't think Ken had any idea. You know, and then I show up and I was like, you know, gung ho, let's do this. <laughs> and I was only there maybe like six days, I think. But and the first movie, I was I wasn't there a lot. I was maybe there one week, and we just shot so much shit. And I brought like all these characters, and yeah, we just had so much fun. And then after that, it just became, you know, I was at Ken's wedding, like, and, and, you know, racing with him and Subarus and, I mean, that guy, crazy, man. He's, he's a, he's, he's a marketing wizard. 
Yeah. So you've you've done some co driving with him, or you've driven like another yeah, well, car. I, mean, I, I went on a uh, there's a there's a there's a clip on the YouTube. It's called Renee Renee Ride Along, and it's me. I was I was doing a bunch of work for Fuel TV, um, which was like a Blue Torch, which probably no one knows about, or basically an action action sports kind of network on Fox. And um, they had a show, The Daily Habit, that I did a lot of correspondence work for. And so he was doing uh, a Jim Connor two ride, uh, premiere ride along at, at the in the port of Long or port of L.A. And all these different people got to go on uh, a ride. So I did like a little you know thing for fuel, and basically I you know hammed it up, pretended I was scared and screaming and, you know, the whole nine. Anyways, there's a video and it's, it's almost like 3 million views. It's crazy. And the responses are so net. Like people are like, what a fag, like <laughs> tell that mini to shut up. What a pussy. I'd, if I was with Ken Block, I wouldn't say a word. And, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, you wouldn't say a word. That's really entertaining, isn't it? You know, like there's a reason that <laughs> mine has 3 million views and Ricky Carmichael or all these other like super, you know, famous kind of action sports people don't have that many. It's because I hammed it up and, and my whole shtick was, you know, I, you know, I'm Travis Pastrana and and uh Ken Block combined. I'm two you know, two hundred and forty two, that was my number. <laughs> <laughs> if you could if you needed to drive stick to be a rally car driver, you know. But yeah, it was really, you know, the the uh the internet uh trolls were just having a heyday with me and my favorite my favorite quote was um because some you know i'd have fans post on it like dude you're a fucking idiot that's renee renee like you know that's ken's friend you know because people would be like ken's probably like shut the fuck up like tell this loser to get out of here <laughs> and so someone posted uh you know, a fan of mine posted, um, dude, Renee Renee's married to, to a, like a model and has kids. And then the person wrote back, uh, Elton John was married once too. <laughs> <laughs> just uh. like, yes. And it's kind of funny. Like my wife would be like, oh, doesn't it, don't, don't you get upset? I'm like, oh, I love this. Like, you know what I mean? Like it really, you know, for, because of the characters and because of the acting stuff, it's like, you you want a reaction, you know, if if and you want either positive or negative, and you want those those reactions to be either total joy and I love it, or like you said to your friend, like I'm gonna stay thirty meters away from this guy because he's like you know he's he's a he's a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so funny, and you mentioned that you're you're married to a model, and uh, your kids are. I don't want to come off saying this a weird way, but you have a super cute family. And I say that as being an interracial kid myself. So I always hear people say like, oh, I'm a minority. It's a Hispanic person. Or, oh, I'm a minority. It's a it's a, uh, a black person. I go, no, you guys have got nothing on me. And I'm, I'm very, very light skinned. Like people would never guess, but I'm half yeah. black. Like I'm a real minority. There's not a lot of other half black people around. So when I see other, it's like a little, you talk about an inside little click. Like you find out somebody else is half black, and it's like you're friends for life. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure it's like you, 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 you get. It, I understand the minority because from the black side, it's like, oh, you're not black, right? Or you're half, you know, you're more, you're white, or you know. So it's like it's interesting, you know, to think about that. I don't see color, you know. I don't. Uh, I know I don't teach my kids. That I, it's just the way I, I see is we're all we're all human beings on, on planet Earth, and and you know, I it still boggles my mind that people trip out over the color of your skin. It just uh, I don't doesn't make any sense to me. The funny thing that I get to see is since people think I'm white, they're comfortable enough to be racist around me lots of times wow. for somebody that is going to be. So I get to hear, you know, any off color things that, that they're saying and then get to maybe talk with them. And then, and I've, I've had this a couple of times over the year, recently on a, a snowboarding trip a couple of weeks ago. And I get to also be around them as they suddenly realize through, a friend whispering in their ear or, you know, me just, you know, very candidly telling them like, well, what would you think if I was black or half black or whatever? And just, you know, watching like the horror on their face and just watching their come, their come to <laughs> Jesus I, moment. I didn't mean you, Nate. I didn't mean you. Uh, you know, people, I, I used to get that on the schoolyard as a kid, but 
you know, I think that people have, have uh, moved past that one, <laughs> at least in my past few experiences. Well, it's like you have those kids that, that throw the N-word around like it's just like cool. And it's like, dude, it's, it's not cool. You know, it may be cool for you and your, your friends, but, you know, there's, there's connotations to that, to that word. And, you know, I'm just warning you now. You say that you keep saying it like you are. Someone's going to, you know, introduce your, your mouth to their fist. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, because it's not, it's not kosher. It's not cool. It's, 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 you know, you, because, because they say it or because rappers say it, that's because they're ignorant, you know? And, and, and I just, you know, I, and I, I'm, I remember like in skateboarding and, and even, and I hear these kids say, and I'm just like, dude, you know, you really should not, you know, say that. That's not, that's not cool. Like, you know, it, it may be, oh no, my black friend's cool with it. And I'm like, well, yeah, because he didn't. He doesn't understand what it means to be called that. He lives in Canada and no one really, you know, says that to him. I'll see it in like a lot of Halloween people like whites will dress up in blackface and they're trying to be like some character and they'll do it with every race, I feel like. And I kind of look at them like, what are you doing? That's so insensitive, you know, like you don't understand the history of like menstrual shows and and what that really meant and um you know and know. And, then, and then there is the case that people just are just you know they're not they just don't know <laughs> and you kind of you're kind of like okay you really don't you don't get it do you? you have no idea and it's like man you should just just next time you go around and, and do this like just do some research <laughs> just look look up the the you know why it's not okay why you shouldn't say these things you know and i mean i and funny enough like i i i was in florida when i was when i was 18 and and uh i'm not black um I lo- I've been, you know, people think I'm mulatto or, or I'm half or cause just because I have olive skin and I had dreadlocks at the time. And I went to the beach and I was with my friend from Barbados. And, you know, I had these, this, this white couple come up to me and tell me that, that this was a white beach. And, Whoa. and that I had to leave. And I was like, I, go, what? I, I, I kind of like, what? He's like, yeah, you guys aren't welcome here. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, this is a white beach. And I'm like, yeah, the sand's white. Cool. Like, <laughs> and they're like, no, you can't. And I, I was, tr- and this is like 1990. And I'm like, huh? Like, racism still exists? Like, you know, I, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't, my friend was super pissed, you know? Like, for me, I just, I was like, oh, I didn't, it didn't make any sense, obviously, because I'm not. And it was just kind of funny to me. But my friend was like, you know, he he got super upset and was you know wanted to fight the guy. I'm just like, chill, it's mellow, whatever. Screw this beach. This beach sucks. Like, <laughs> let's go. You know, but in this day and age, you know, there are dumb people out there. People forget Florida is the South. You know, it's like, and how the South is still like. I grew up in the South. Um, I mean, it, it, there's intolerance and racism everywhere, and even in our communities, like Renee. Well, here, Renee what's that? No, no, no. I was gonna say, like here, it's 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 it, your race, race. There's racial um, against Chinese, you know, because Vancouver's yeah. like got a huge Chinese population, you know, and people are you know throw the c word, I guess, around or or whatever, and it's just. I mean, I and I don't. It's not a, just a white thing. It's definitely you know like my like. The, the blacks that I knew in LA were anti uh, Mexican, <laughs> you know. Like it seems like it that there's the racism has no color boundaries as well, you know. And it kind of goes both ways. It's like you know people, and I think that's just that's just our our human nature to not like something because it, it's it's to not like something you don't understand or you don't you know that you're not part of or I don't know. That's exactly it. Is is yeah. what you, what you don't understand, and it's lots of times people that haven't even had experience with that other group that they don't like. It's just they've heard their father or grandfather or whoever in their social circle say things, and they've just taken that on as part of their uh, dogma on life or whatever. Too. Um, you mentioned you know living in L.A. and it, it kind of uh, parlays to another question that I that I had for you. There was an app a couple years ago that launched um, called Feed. And mm-hmm. it was 
pretty groundbreaking at the time. My friend Paul, who was on uh, one of the one of the podcasts earlier, turned me on to it. And at, at its inception, when I first saw it, it was really cool because they did like all kinds of um, you know. One, there was a big skate presence on there. Two, you could see titties, but it wasn't like overzealous porn all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that changed a little bit, but, um, did you have some involvement with those folks? Yeah. So, so my friend, um, this guy, Tony De Niro, he, he's, a uh, was one of my wife's really good friends and, and I became friends with him. He's a musician and, and, uh, done work with him and, and stuff. And he kind of, he was working with, with, with feed. And, and so he was the one who kind of, he introduced and talked to me, like even before when it was in beta stages before it even launched. And, and I've, I knew about it for a long time. And then when it was about to launch, um, Tony approached me to kind of, um, get involved with the action sports and, and skate and snow and, and, and whatnot. Um, just cause he knows that that's, that was my world. So I ended up bringing like, you know, Brandon Beeble and P-Rod and we went up to the feed house and they ended up, uh, building like a half pipe and, and, you know, I was, I was able to help those guys kind of get the whole skate, the skate, you know, that the reason why there was a huge skate presence was definitely because, um, I was able to introduce it to people and get people, you know, signed up and, and verified and all that stuff. I mean, feed in the beginning was so cool. Like just, just the, like the images, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Instagram's cool. You got a tiny little square, but with feed, you could, you could post like, you know, 1500 megapixel image, you know, you could post video, like a video, you could post all, it was basically all the different social media sites kind of combined you know, and definitely, you know, the plus was the nudity and the art, artistic nudity. Right. But what happened was it got really popular. And then you had like these fucking idiot kids jerking off and, and like, you know, turning it into Tinder or something or whatever. <laughs> and they kind of, because of them, because of these, you know, like weirdos, um, Apple shut it down or, or, uh, yeah, the internet cops came in and were like, you can't, you know, you can't, this, it can't work, right? And so that kind of, and it got shut, like it actually got pulled from, 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 um, the iTunes store and they had to basically, and I don't know how long it was, but I know that really hurt them because they were on this huge project, like they were, you know, killing it, you know, they were there, the, there was like even a week that a million people had signed up and, Things were really blowing up, and then all of a sudden they got pulled. And so it was more, I think they kind of were like, oh, we're just doing some beta testing or whatever. But it was actually they had to uh, figure out how to deal with the, the crazy nudity. And the, they had to go through and cancel cancel um, accounts. And, and I think that that really hurt them being being off, the, you know, because everyone's like talking about it. And then all of a sudden it was gone. If you had it, you could still use it, you know, but anyone, all the new, you know, and basically the new followers is how they were going to be able to sell the company. And then, and then it kind of, it didn't fizzle out, but they kind of, uh, I felt like, well, Tony for one kind of got, he didn't get axed out. He just kind of told me, Hey, chill with the feed stuff. I'm not cool with these, like whatever, something was going on internally. Right. Um, and he was, I was supposed to, I was actually going to build a skate park for them, you know, a bunch of stuff. And then they just kind of like, you know, another, you know, one of those, another, another one of those things where you put a lot of effort and energy into it, hoping someone will, you know, give back to you. And then in the end, they just kind of be like, oh, you didn't do anything for us anyways. Uh so yeah, that's what that's kind of what happened with feed. I mean, it was a great idea, and, and I was promised a lot. I was, you know, promised um, equity and 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 some some stuff in the in the company, and and you know, egos came into effect. And uh, I really don't, you know, for me, I don't. It's not about money ever. Right. Um, I need money to to feed my kids, but I'm not going to, you know, just do something because of a money attachment. And it's, you know. And I kind of pride myself on that, and I and I find that I, I get connected with the right people by, 
being who I am. Everyone says, dude, you got to cover your back or watch your, you know, you shouldn't trust people. And it's like, well, if, if I stop trusting people, then what's the point, right? <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> like, then you're just, you don't trust anyone and nothing happens, you know? And, and some of the best stuff, I, you know, I always, I always look at it like the stuff that I do, it, it's going to come back to me at some point in my life. And I'm right now I might not need it. So it's cool. And, and, you know, who knows somewhere down the line, the f- stuff I did for fetal somehow we, in a weird way, come back to me and, and, you know, bless me in another, another, another means. Uh, so, always. So do the people that know you as Renee Renee or, um, maybe just from the DC mountain lab video, um, what would you say that you do? Because you were involved in a lot of things, even like feed or, or uh, you know, the red dragons I'm, or whatever. What does it say? What do you? What, what would you tell people? Like, yeah, this is what I do. I mean, I'm. I, I would. I would say I'm like a marketing person, in a sense, or a brand uh, ambassador or, or a hype man. Um, but I'm also. I'm. I would say I'm an artist. I would say you know I'm. I'm school. I went to fine art school. I'm a painter. Um, but I'm also, you know, a musician and I, I write and sing and, and, uh, I love to act, you know, I really think I am like a Renaissance man in, in the truest form. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I, I'm not one to toot my horn. I kind of, you know, that's the last thing I like to do unless it's yesterday. <laughs> so Craig McMorris, you guys know who that is, right? Oh yeah. Heard of him uh, so, so Craig, um, and Mark, obviously, uh, we randomly enough became friends, uh, through, uh, my friend at, at Burton, um, Greg, uh, Dachshund introduced the, Mark was in town. Those guys were in town. They're like, Oh, hook up with Renee. He's awesome. And so they, you know, they're Canadian too. And obviously I knew who they were and I get this text from Mark. Hey buddy, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, who is this? Like Mark McMorris, you want to hang out? I'm like, sure. Like whatever. I'll, you know, I, I like meeting people. And so we hung out and, and those guys are awesome. Super rad guys. And, and Craig is, is, dude, the guy for how old he is, he's, he's like, did you guys watch the X games? A little bit. Uh, um, no, I can't say I did. I mean, I will, dude. The guy has not been announcing, but he is a professional announcer. Like the guy is really good at doing at doing. Like I was kind of blown away, and I, I had also seen like on Instagram or something that Sal had given him a compliment as well as as well as Todd Richards, and I was like, wow, that's huge. Like, he looked two guys he looked comfortable are, too. What's that? Whenever they'd pan to him, he looked comfortable. Yeah, no, and and I mean, and the, and and he was like telling it saying his brother shouldn't have got that high of a score like how awesome <laughs> i was just like dude that's amazing fired. what's that shots fired that damn on national television i know but that's but it's the, that's why he's so good is because he's being honest you know and that's that's everything so like so anyways he he was in town the other day and he had this brand new subaru and i'm like yo what's what's up with this subaru I'm like, I'm looking for a new car. Like, how much? And he's like, oh, it was, you know, they gave it to him. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What do you mean gave it to you? They're like, you know, just to use. And I'm like, well, I want that deal. Hook me up. And he was kind of <laughs> – I kept pressing him. I'm like, dude, the, just – you don't – all you have to do is get me the contact, you know. So he ended up giving me the contact yesterday. And I I had to, like, toot my horn and, and oh, you know, like, this is what i done. Like, you know, posted some videos of this shit and – I did. I, I talked a little bit about the podcast, but it was more of for this um, Plan Nine. Uh, I made this this uh, skateboarding trade, promoting trade trades work through skateboarding. So I was pitching it to them like I needed a car for this tour to drive everyone around in, and and that that it would be a good idea for Subaru to give me a car <laughs> because I'd be a great. You know, and I, I, the funny thing is, I would probably help them in a sense, you know. And I, I think that that's kind of my background. I don't want to tell them I'm a marketing guy, and, and you know, oh, I'm gonna tweet and Twitter or whatever your stuff. But I feel like I really could, you know, help. You not know, help them, but I would. I would definitely promote the hell out of them if they gave me a car to use, right? So I wrote that that uh, email yesterday, and I was like, ah, oh, and it took me so long. To like write it because I'm just like, dude, I hate, I hate like 
trying to tell someone about yourself or make yourself look good or you know like it's the, the one thing I dislike about any and that's the one thing as far as acting or anything goes and that's why like kids nowadays are such good self promoters and they're so easy to tell you that they're the shit whereas like I grew up in a generation where you you didn't say that and you you uh you let you know if someone wants to tell you that great but you kind of you know like humbled and and so it was interesting yesterday trying to you know explain to Subaru Canada why they needed <laughs> to give me a car <laughs> In, in, in your response, they haven't hit me back, and I, I sent Craig. I'm like, oh my god, like, are they going to be like, what the hell? Who is this fucking crazy guy? But if you guys were Subaru, you'd give me a car, right? Oh, there wouldn't be oh, only a neon one. Neon exactly. <laughs> That's like what I'm yellow about. neon with pink uh, racing stripes or whatever. And I would own it. I would live it. I would. I would. You know, shoot, I'd paint a painting for the dealership. You name it. <laughs> I, I think you just have to get past email communication and get, especially face to face, and it's a done deal. Yeah. No, I should have probably just, instead of said anything, just go, hey, like, let's meet up. Or, I mean, or even like, hey, you guys make the, the car I want is an Outback. It's a family car. Have you guys seen my family? Like, you're going to see my family. You're going to, I'm going to take pictures of your car with my family. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not just going to take a car and not work for it. You know what I mean? I'm going to I'm going to put work in and make that car the raddest car there is for families. So funny. as I'm pitch, I'm like pitching you guys. <laughs> we're we're sold. We're sold. You you can we're have sold. I've tried that in the past with Gatorade like I uh I worked at Wendell's this summer and I would do like orientation and Gatorade was a sponsor and I made this little Instagram clip where I was like spraying Gatorade into kids' mouths during the orientation and stuff. I'm like, all right, I got a job at Gatorade. Like, obviously, they're going to see this and see that I'm just, like, feeding kids this Gatorade. And boom, that's market that done. I'm, they need me on their marketing team, but I never heard back. So I feel your pain. <laughs> no, but it's – and then it's always someone that doesn't deserve it. You're like, man, that is some BS. What the hell? It'll, it'll yeah. come around. Like you said with feed, it'll come around eventually. Oh yeah, no. I, I mean, I, the f- funny thing is, I'm actually looking for a family car. So you know, if that doesn't, this was just kind of like, oh sweet, like you know, no car payments. I'll take a car for a year or whatever. You know, switch it up. I'll promote the hell out of this thing. I'll talk, you know, talk about it on my podcast or, or who knows. So speaking of the podcast, I'm a fan. I'm a listener. I'm impressed with your ten push-ups on the last episode. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wife was just like, are you kidding? Yeah, that is embarrassing. I'm like, so needless to say, I, I, I had like a, a gnarly elbow surgery from skateboarding and they took a tendon out of my, it was like, I was like the a guinea pig of the world. This is the first, like, I was the first person to have a real live tendon put in my elbow. And there was uh, at UBC, which is like in, in the doctors out there, it was like groundbreaking. And, and I was able to get it done right away. Um, so I ripped a tendon in my elbow. And so the process, they took a tendon out of my wrist and put it in my elbow. And this is in like 90, I don't know, like 95 or 96. Anyways, I mean, it's my, my elbow is still jacked, but I have a weak, it's, my left side is weak. It's, I have a left, my, my, my arm doesn't bend the way it should. You know, so <laughs> that's my excuse. That's not, I mean, there's a lot of people that could, you struggle for like one push up. Yeah. So I didn't feel, and I mean, I obviously Dave is like this gnarly muscle, you know, kind of strong guy. And that's never been, I, I'm, you know, I have core strength, obviously, but I'm not, I, I don't want to be a muscle guy. I don't like weights. I can surf all day. I can go for a bike ride. I can walk and climb stairs. But anything that has like just to go to a gym to work out just sounds like such a dumb thing. To me. <laughs> I tried it for a little it's bit. Not, it's not sustainable. The best thing is if there's like girls in yoga pants there. That'll make you come back you, for a little while. Or if there's red dragon girls stripping every time you lift more weights. Yes. There you go. So, but I'm not. That's just not. I, I No, thanks. 
you know, I'd rather skateboard or snowboard or do fun things. Like my exercise it has to be enjoyable. You know, I don't like going for a run. I'm sorry, I, my ankles are so jacked I can barely walk. Like <laughs> it's just not it's not part of the program. But some people that's what you know, that's that's their out that's that's what they do. They love it. So Yeah, so it's, it's ten push ups. <laughs> <laughs> so I kinda wanted to dig into like some of the um logistics and different aspects of the podcast um as a fan and, and as a fellow podcaster on all your secrets yeah right <laughs> well there's there's two things that just jump out at me that uh, we should be doing that we should just take from your podcast one is get an intern so we'd have some kind of whipping boy to blame when things go wrong and... yeah that was new uh the the murdoch the the murmur he's he's uh i think he's done three now and he's good because he's he kind of uh, sides with me a little bit, you know. <laughs> Dave always gets on my case sometimes, but uh, yeah, no. Th- and he just volunteered, which is awesome. So if anyone's listening and they want to volunteer to be an intern, I don't know how we do it because I'm in Southern Pennsylvania and AJ's in Boreal, but maybe you could be anywhere. I don't know. You yeah, just have to take some anywhere. shit from us. The second thing is that we need to do strip trivia. Yeah. My mind was blown. Snowboard snowboard strip trivia too, right? Yeah. I I have my shirt off right now, so I (laughs) – But, I mean, I normally do this with socks and a smile on, so. (laughs) I know. We're talking about getting – yeah, that more – some more girls. and I mean, luckily my wife doesn't listen to it, but she's like, don't talk shit about me. (laughs) I'm like, oh, nothing happens on the. She like listens to the first bit and just she's over it. She doesn't like she doesn't like it, so it's good. Well, but yeah, strip trivia was fun. Most women in general don't listen to podcasts yet. The podcast listenership is like seventy five to almost eighty percent male. So every time I talk to a girl that does listen to podcasts, I'm just like surprised. Just having you know knowing that nerdy fact in the back of my mind, and then it's like, oh, really? What podcast do you listen to? And it's almost always like. This American Life, and then uh, Serial, the, the two big uh, NPR ones. Huh. Yeah, I mean, this whole new, the podcast, obviously I've heard about podcasts, but Dave kind of really woken me up to podcasts, and, and I didn't even know, like, I was tripping because my phone, like, all of a sudden had podcasts. I was like, what's this? <laughs> like, <laughs> and they're all, they're all on there. I'm like, oh, here's my show. This is awesome. I had no, uh, no idea. So when Dave was kind of putting the idea together, and I'm assuming it was it was Dave, was it um, a spinoff of something that was going on with uh, Jason Ellis and, and the Sirius yeah. XM stuff? Yeah. So I think I think I mean Dave, me and Dave had a meeting um, last year. He kind of was like, "Hey, I, I want to go for lunch. I want to talk to you about something," and so he. Basically, you know, we went for lunch, and so what had happened was he was on the the, the Ellis show, and one of the producers on the show was like, "Hey, you know, you have a, you have a good voice for radio. Like, have you ever thought about, you know, doing a radio show?" And uh, he was he was like, oh, you know, didn't think about it. So he ended up coming home and buying some equipment to do to do a radio show, and then he kind of realized, "Wow, it's it's uh, it's a lot of work." And he thought maybe it'd be better if he had a co-host or someone to do it with. So he just called and, you know, we went for lunch. And I was like, yeah, sure. I, you know, I got a million other things. I might as well do a podcast <laughs> too. And uh, at first, you know, it was just kind of like whatever. And now it's, you know, it's kind of evolving. And I think we're on, going on to number 17 or something now. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely – and, I mean, Dave's, Dave's, you know, bought, like, some legit equipment, you know. Like, he bought, like, all these crazy mics and, and uh, you know, he's, he's definitely spent some money to make, you know, the podcast sound as good as it can and, and, and whatnot. That's not uh, – we don't have uh, – if you hear jingling, that's the uh, the janitor at, he, at work. His keys are going around there. It's not. Uh, it's not the. Uh, it's not Santa Claus or anything. Okay, I, I, was... don't you, I don't know if you heard the jingling. Going yeah, 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 yeah. We can hear it. 
We did. <laughs> so did Dave set up an actual podcast studio, like a room that is specific just for podcasting, or is it like a dual purpose area? It's yeah, it's a dual. So at uh, he works, he does obviously he's the RDS designer, and he works at Center Distribution. So they have like a little showroom, and that's where we do it. And it's kind of good too because he's got all the clothes around, so it kind of is uh, dampening, I guess, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Kind of sounds good for. It just sounds good, I guess, with the clothes around him or something. I don't know, but yeah, it kind of. And then he's got a sound guy that he. I mean, it's it's yeah. He's 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 actually gone deep into this uh, podcast thing. It's not like, and we're you know he's not making any money yet at it. So he's he's definitely putting the money into it. Yeah, that, I, t- I told him about the Subaru thing. He's like, no, that's my car. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, well, no, dude. I didn't. I, I sold them on Plan Nine, not on the podcast. That was like nothing. It wasn't about the podcast. <laughs> so, so I could go really deep and nerdy into the the podcast logistics and the sound guy and everything, but I'll, I'll spare our listenership from that and <laughs> ask you what's going on with Plan Nine Official. So Plan Nine Official. Um, every that's the, everyone. What is Plan Nine Official? It basically. So, I mean, I could tell you how I got involved, but anyways. I'll just say um, Plan 9 Official is, is kind of like a, a – I don't do – you, do you know the term social license? I think I do, but like you might have to explain license it to, to me. Operate. So Plan 9's parent company is, is, is called the BCMEA, which is the British Columbia Maritime Employers Association. And so the president of that company is my – is the co-founder of Plan 9 Official. And so what Plan 9 Official really is is the kind of, you know, in in from their side of things, it's to promote the waterfront and the water, um, to kind of give it a new image and to change people's perspective of the waterfront. Because in the past, um, longshore and waterfront type people, it's it, there's been a negative connotation towards um, gangs and drugs and, and what have you, you know. So... They're kind of Andy, my Smith, and he's my partner in in, in Plan Nine. Kind of approached me um, based on my marketing skills and and almost just a random occurrence that we met over the over the summer in Vancouver, and and we just started talking. He's a super super cool guy, and he was just he wondered if I could market an intangible something that wasn't for sale and more of an idea or concept. And I was like, I don't see why not. It sounds, sounds like a a challenge. So I I was kind of super about it. And, um, so yeah, that's kind of where it is. And I've done, I sold him on skateboarding. I sold him on, on the skateboard culture and, and, and skateboarding in general saying, here's a great, subsect of humanity that most people most corporate entities overlook because it's intimidating or they don't understand it but the reality is like skateboarders um are selfless and and you know i i i showed him that by taking him to we did there was a skateboard contest the battle of hastings that i was emceeing and rick mccrank was you know this is the contest for money and rick mccrank was trying a trick and i was like rebate you know one more time do it again do it again i gave him like eight tries he finally landed it everyone screams and and he kind of approached me afterward and he's like he's like um he's like i don't understand like aren't people upset and i'm like what do you mean he's like well you gave that guy like eight tries to land that trick and 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 i'm like yeah and he's like but aren't the other competitor i mean it's for money right and i'm like yeah and he's like well aren't aren't his competitors upset like that's not fair and i'm like what do you mean it's like that's skateboarding you know, it doesn't, people want to see him land that trick, you know, and he was just that, that right there kind of opened his eyes to the skateboard culture and, and who we are as, as, as people. And, and, you know, like I, I really express it like skateboarders, you know, are the type of people that could change the world and, and, and can most people, you know, you give them an idea and, and the most, most people are negative and say that can't be done where skateboarders will always try and make something work and figure something out. And it's that creative mindset of, you know, not only skateboarding, snowboarding, you know, snowboarding and skateboarding, surfing, any of the board sports, really. There's just something about, um, you know, especially skateboarding, too, because for me, anyways, skateboarding was not a good thing as far as the public eye. 
it's like, you know, there was a point we were worse than bums, you know, we were, we were the lowest of the low. Everyone hated skateboarding, you know, there was no, I was ne- I didn't, you know, you didn't skateboard because you're going to make money. <laughs> you skateboarded to rebel and do something that everyone else hated, you know, and I think that really, you know, most skaters really like that, that uh, independence. The fact that you convinced this guy to go down like the skateboarding vertical, if you want to use kind of the um, cliche the corporate speech, <laughs> yeah, um, makes me think that within two to three years, uh, there will be a Rene Rene colorway Subaru Outback on the market. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I, it's funny because he kind of, he has no idea and, and, not that I had any idea, but I really I sold him on this idea of making this movie about um, skateboarding and trades. And even though it really has nothing to do with the waterfront, it has nothing to do with all that. What it does is it's it's putting the BCMEA in a in a in a great light for doing something very unique and different that no one else has done. Um, and with this project, like I've met. You know, just I I have a meeting next week with Skills BC, which is like a government kind of agency that promotes the trades and goes to schools and does these things. And And I showed the movie to the president and she was just like, you know, speechless. She's she she hit me up like I'm I, I want to talk to you again. This is incredible. Like I, I can't believe what you've done. And, you know, and that and that really was me going to they have a you know the bcmea has a training facility (laughs) and i went to and i'm like this is a skate park like there's container gaps can we skate at this and he's like if it makes sense so then i just kind of created this idea of promoting you know telling the story of of skate trades and and you know welders carpenters um all the skate spots that you need that we skate are, are all built by tradespeople you know, and it's kind of like they they go hand in hand, and there's like this symbiotic relationship between skateboarding and trades. That's an amazing connection. I've always thought about it the opposite way. I always felt like there's some welder that's crying a little bit when you know he's just driving down the street and seeing a group of guys sessioning the handrail that he put up years ago. <laughs> I'm sure if he doesn't skate, yeah, for sure he's probably upset. <laughs> but a skater, like one of the welders I was talking to, he's like, "Oh man, I'll go and look at welds and see the beat and see how well it was done." You know, <coughs> which is I, really I'll cool stuff, and I'll be like, "That's these are these guys have to be skaters." No, you'll just, some you'll see some transit, you'll see like quarter pipe transitions. I'm like, "There's no way they have to skate." They're like, "Oh yeah, we'll build this," you know, and then secretly they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna skate this later." You can go <laughs> to Barcelona, and it's like the who like it's just mental like, and it's funny because I talked to some some of my friends in Barcelona, and they're like. You know, they'll hire skateboarder designers to try and build a skate spot, and they suck. But the actual architects that aren't skaters that are naturally building these things, they're like you, they, those skate spots are like incredible, and they they're not skaters at all. They're just it's weird. It's really weird. It's sometimes you know the best skate spots are not skater built. You know, they're just you know natural weird like <laughs> architects that are just kind of getting weird like love park you know like all these all these legendary spots it's kind of like you know and it's it's funny too because you know oh skate spot skate park skate park it's like that whole street skater mentality is like you'd never film a park you never film a part in a, in a skate park you know you got to go to the streets to make it legit it's kind of interesting we even love park like edmund bacon was really down with skaters he wasn't a skater, but he thought it was amazing what they were doing with his work. Yeah, right? I think that'll happen more and more. Like the LA, the West LA courthouse. I don't know if you follow much what's going on down there, but um, they basically have allowed skaters to skate there. Um, there was this battle, and they, they had like, it was a. I feel like it was three months. It was a quite a long time where they said, all right, no one skate here. They put like posters on the ledges. And they're like, please don't skate this. We're trying to figure out how we can make this a permanent, just like not a skate park, but just a spot you could skate. Mm-hmm. And no one, had the, no one skated, and they figured it out. And you know, Nike funded all this like maintenance money for the next five years. So now they have like it's it's still it's still operating as the courthouse, but people are allowed. Oh, in L.A., you mean right? What's that? In L.A., you mean? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Nike bought it out, I guess, for a couple of years, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they're ten like fifty grand for the next five years is what they're they committed to. That's um, cool. Yeah, so I you know, I can see in public spaces, you know, I, I I would hope that we, you know, we'll reach to a point where skaters I mean that's that's the thing. It's like you go to LACMA and, and you have like these skaters skating this spot. It's like if only if people would understand here that it's public art. It's like you can sit down in a park and watch people skateboard for free. Like you know what I mean? It's like it, I don't understand why we haven't caught on to that here. That you know, basically, you just build a skate spot, put it in the center of a park, and put benches and you know grass areas where people sit and they can sit there and watch skateboarding. You know, it's like art form. I don't, you know, I think people, we need to learn from Europe as far as that goes. Absolutely. So as we start to kind of uh, wrap it up here, I've got a couple more uh, kind of canned questions that I've, I've asked in the past on a couple of podcasts. Um, and, and this one's had a pretty uh, similar response so far. So it'll be interesting to see what, what you say. And, and some of it might have to do with um, being a little bit more inland, but we'll see. If you could only... Do one of the following for the rest of your life, skateboard, snowboard, or surf, which would it be and why? Uh, surf, because um, it's easier on my body. <laughs> Is there a longer question? I mean, surfing, I I love surfing. And I, I just, it's, it's kind of like when I skateboarded and when I snowboarded, I always thought I was surfing. Like when I would go powder... You know, I'm doing slashes and carves. All that stuff was inspired from surfing. Even though I never surfed until I was older, I always imagined myself, you know, surfing. You know, and I grew up skating Sealand, which is the oldest um, cement snake run in, in, in North America. I would do laybacks and would do, you know, like these Bertelman carves. And, and it was all surf inspired. So I think... You know, if you ask that question, would I rather be what sport would I like to be the best at? It would be surfing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably the the sport I'm least good at. But it's the one that I feel like it's. You know, when when you first snowboard or you first skateboard, how like I mean, I remember my first snowboard. I slept with a thing. I was so amped. You know, I was like the super grom, just pumped up on having a board and and skating the same way. Like I just skated, and all I could think about was skateboarding. It's like when I started surfing, it was the same that same feeling of of just being so hooked and so in love with it. You know, and I mean, with surfing, it would definitely be in a warmer climate, and and uh, I feel like. You see, like these old dogs surfing. You know, it just seems a little less uh, tedious on the body. I mean, I love skating. There's nothing you can't replace the grind, and I love powder snowboarding. It's like, but I would say, yes, yeah, surfing would definitely be uh, the one thing. How, how is it? How how have other people same kind of result? Surfing, yeah, surfing. one thousand percent. Well, who else was it? Terje and 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 Todd. Yeah, for yeah. sure they would be surfing. And, Sil- and Sylvia too. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh for sure. I mean, it's like it's funny when I see all the surfers, uh, all the snowboarders, especially in Encinitas and stuff. They're just like it's like surf crazy. There, I mean, it just surfing is just such a. I just love it. You know, that's the one thing. The one thing I do miss most about living in California is the surf. And everyone's like, "Oh, there's surf here." I'm like, "Yeah, but I've never been a fan of five millimeter wetsuits." So that's. <laughs> I've got my five four three ready for the uh, forty three degree water. If the if the surf lines up in this area, yeah. Oh man, it was interesting to me that you said that initially because it's better on your body. And my, I've only been learning to surf over the past couple of years, and so the first, I don't know, twenty times, I felt like it was the hardest thing ever on my body. But some of that is just that I'm I'm older and I'm trying to do something new and, and going through that uh, le- love it and, and hate it kind of uh, learning curve that you described earlier. I'm a full water rat. So I've been, I was born in, in lake country and have like, you know, jumped into whirlpools as a kid and gone white, white like creaking, I used to call it. It's like basically tubing without the tube. So I'm kind of like uh, a really strong swimmer. 
And so when I started surfing, it was kind of, and I knew because of like jumping into whirlpools, you, you let your body go, you, you relax, you can't fight the water and current. So I think when I, that was the one thing that was, wasn't hard for me was, was the, the, the pounding. I kind of enjoyed getting my ass kicked and beat up. And that's definitely, like you said, it's not, if you're not a strong swimmer and, and you're not used to it, you'll fuck, I mean, people die, right? Oh, yeah. So I think for me, I was lucky that I was a total dolphin and and just loved being in the water and and so because if I didn't, then I you know surfing it's not for for people that are aren't strong swimmers or don't like getting you know five gallons of salt water up their nose. <laughs> It's cleansing. <laughs> it, oh, it's super. I mean, I dude, I miss it. You know, there was a point where I was surfing three times a day. You know, and it's so good for the body, like health wise, and and paddle. You know, and seriously, when I was surfing three times a day, I could probably do a hundred push ups. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt, the surfer V, right? Oh, totally. So totally. the the streak continues. I'm psyched that uh, surfing was the answer. the The other question is is interesting and sometimes kind of thought provoking. If you if you uh, today, if your your present uh, amount of knowledge could go back and talk to your like 18 year old self, what life advice would you give yourself? Wow. Yeah. This one's always like a stumper. Like, Oh man, I don't know. I don't know if I would change anything. That's a fair answer. You know, I, I, I kind of, obviously there's different routes and there's different, you know, on a success table, you know, I could I could choose uh, to maybe um, follow through with with uh, an athlete, my athletics, and and I was a track star, and had, you know, probably could have got a scholarship to to do that. I mean, maybe, but I like I mean, that's such a then everything would change all the stuff that i have done wouldn't wouldn't exist you know like if you choose something at 18 you would kind of like i don't know i mean that's i think it would be easier for somebody else but for me it's it's such a you know like my life has been there's so many ups and downs and everything kind of correlates with each other and everything has kind of made me who i am at this point you know whereas if i was just say a one you know if it was just a one dimensional thing, you know, maybe it would be easier to answer that question. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It sounds like you have no regrets, not even one. Yeah, I really don't. I don't think, I mean, I, my family and my wife and, and, and everything where I'm at right now, you know, like I don't at 18, you know, I was 18. I was homeless in Florida. Shit. Like, you know, maybe, but then I'd be like, Oh, don't go to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that, but it all shapes, you know, it's all, the, all these things have shaped me. Um, you know, maybe, maybe at 18, I'd say, don't go skate Palo Alto and dislocate your elbow. Mm. You know, then I wouldn't, I would be able to do more than 10 push ups on the, on the podcast. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I think, I mean, it would be, you know, buy a lottery ticket. Here's the magic numbers. Maybe that would be <laughs> the only thing. That's right where I go. You know, I go right, right? to the money. Is like, oh, buy lots of Google stock. That's what I would yeah. tell myself. There you go. And you know, Instagram. Hundred percent for a billion dollars. <laughs> I mean, if I could go back twelve months and when I was like, man, I should buy some Apple stock. And even though it was like so expensive, I would have tripled my money. Closed at a new high today. I know that's what I'm talking, and like I don't understand. But I, I mean, I don't understand investing, anyways. Just not really my cup of tea. But I always think, like, man, Apple's coming out with the iPhone six. Like, buy stock, you know, because it's gonna, you know, like it's gonna go through the roof. And of course, it does, and everyone just kind of. I mean, people must make fortunes off that if they're smart, if they have the money to invest in it. Because how much? How much are they stock? How much is the stock of Apple right now? Closed just under 120 today, 119 and some change. Yeah, like I remember when it was, it was like 50 bucks. Yeah, or like or even less, much less, single digits, bucks. like way back when. Yeah, two dollars. <laughs> I remember we had Apple computers in my elementary school. It's pretty crazy with floppy disks. <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd change. I, I think uh, no regrets. 
So where can people find you on the internet and where do you spend um, most of your, your time on the internet? What's your social media network of preference? Uh, mostly Instagram. Um, and that's at Jason Bothe, uh, Jason B O T H E. Uh, I do have a Twitter, but it's pretty much, I post on Instagram and then send it to my Twitter and my Facebook. Twitter would be Renee Renee one. And Facebook, I think is Jason Ryan Bothe or something or, but yeah, no Instagram mostly. I, I Pinterest <laughs> recently. Seriously, I don't know how it works. I keep getting these updates or info thing, and I'm like, oh, I don't, I, uh, why did I sign up? I don't know what, what I'm doing here with the Pinterest. But anyways, I think Pinterest. Yeah. Talk to and, sorority girls about that one. They seem to like. You know, I pick on them a lot, but it seems like all these chicks that are in sororities are all about Pinterest. They're like experts. Pen it. Pen it. <laughs> Uh, you can also, if you check, uh, plan nine official.com, we got, uh, just, re- I, I mean, I don't keep up with it as much as I should cause I'm so busy, but, uh, I try and update, um, do updates here and there. Uh, there's a five minute trailer to the, to the skate trades movie on there. So if your listeners want to go check that, that out, that'd be rad. Um, what else? Oh, uh, this boy's life. Uh, podcast on iTunes, I guess. Sometimes on Sirius uh, XM on Sundays at four o'clock. On the, every every other so often. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, there's. I'm sure there's more things. I, I'm doing an autism skate day that I'd like to promote here in Canada. I met this kid named Killa B. Uh, that has autism and skateboards, and he decided he did a surf thing called uh, Surfs Up, uh, where they have autistic kids get in the water and go surfing. And he thought it would be cool to do a skate one, so Plan Nine and BCMEA have decided to sponsor that, and that should be going, I think, in June fourteenth. So you can, uh, I don't know, I think they have a, I think it's odd, I don't even know the Instagram for that. But if you go on my Instagram, you can see posts Autism Skate Day. Very cool. I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well. That's rad. I love I love anything like that that's just, you know, doing the right things for the right reasons. You know, and that's another, like, you know, with, with this opportunity, like I tell everyone all this, like, what is Plan 9? What's this? And I'm just like, you know, to be honest, it, for me, it's how I, I have I have access to um, people and, and, and things that skateboarders would never have access to. And I'm trying to, you know, put skateboarding in a different light to these to these corporate types and and show them that hey we're not you know you shouldn't be afraid of us and you know if if you support us we support you in a sense and we can you know do rad things together and and all we all we need is the opportunity and the chance and we'll we'll we'll, we'll show you how, how what we can do and so far it's like you know people are in in the corporate side just kind of blown away with with how awesome skateboarders i mean i know this but i've just kind of you know i've i've unlocked pandora's box here <laughs> well, and i'm able to do rad stuff you know like i the whole autism skate day i took it to andy i said hey uh these guys want to do this autism skate day like i want to support this he's like 100 percent. what do you want like you know we'll we'll cover it they're doing uh so in Squamish, they're building a, a skate park under under this bridge, and the guys actually they they contacted me to help them get a, a crowdfunding uh, video together. And I'm like, well, how much do you guys need? And they're like, you know, like seven grand. And I'm like, well, let me see. And so I went and talked to Andy. I'm like, hey, Plan Nine should sponsor these guys. Need seven grand or whatever it is. Like, let's let's do it. And he's like, well, whatever they raise, we'll match. You know, so there's like I think they basically just they needed fifteen thousand and they're at eight, so I think we're you know I'm able to get them the rest of the funds to to, to finish this project, which is so awesome, you know. It's that's really awesome. And what I'm seeing is kind of a, a reoccurring theme is that um you know, you mentioned it, skateboarding for me it was a bad thing in most people's eyes and there's a huge disconnect between the skateboarder on the street and the major corporation. And you're like the liaison, like the voice of the skateboarder. There still is a skateboarder because as soon as 
you're, you're not coming from skateboarding organically. Um, you know, skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing, all the board sports have like a really sensitive bullshit factor, right? If you're like oh, sure. somebody who's in it just to make a quick buck with a, a gadget or, or, you know, build a skate park and steal all the money or somebody like that, they get called out really quick by skateboarding. But um, you're an authentic voice uh, for all of the, the, I hate to say the word, but board sports. Yeah, oh, I mean, and that's the thing too. Is 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 Plan Nine as well as BCMA? We're we're not for profit. We're not. Uh, you know, I'm not getting rich. <laughs> you know, I get I get, I have a salary, and that's great. But it's not. It's it's really. You know, I see it. I get to hire my friends. I get to hire you know skaters and and everyone that worked on that project from the catering to the the sound guy to the editor. Everybody's a skater. You know, and and and, and I really want that to con continue and and you know we're building a, a, a Andy uh, Andy Smith my the the, the my cohort in, in plan 9 we 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 built a demo ramp and so I was storing it downstairs and he's like well you might as well just leave it here and I was like oh it's it's it doesn't fit you know there's two parking spots and he's like well just build something that does and I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> so we're building an underground uh, little, it's like a, you know, three foot high bowl, super sick, all wood. I mean, the thing's a piece of art. Um, we got, we're poured cement block uh, pool coping. And once a, once a week, we're going to do like a skate night and just invite, you know, a lot of the mostly older guys and, and just people that, that are in the scene to come down and skate, hang out, have some drinks and pizza and, and whatnot. So, yeah, like a, a, I, I feel, you know, I'm I'm happy with what I'm doing, but I'm also happy to to really give back to to the community that has given me so much, you know. And I really think, you know, I thank Plan Nine, I thank Andy for for giving me the opportunity to to utilize and and showcase skateboarders in such an awesome light. So awesome, man! I, I think we did it. I think we just made some radio gold. Radio gold, nice. Uh oh, don't tell Dave. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta ask one He's quick. Be thing. like, what the hell, you lot, you you moonlighting? Doing another <laughs> podcast? <laughs> yeah, come back anytime. What's that, He's, AJ? He's oh like, yeah, I just want to ask one last question. This is from Lane Kanak, and uh, he is always he's a fan of the podcast, and I hope to have him on one day. But um, he just wanted to ask. If you've ever, with the fanny pack, when you're Renee Renee or just wearing a fanny pack, if you've ever cut a hole in it and put your dick in there, so when people ask, what do you have in the fanny pack, you can have, you know, show them a nice little surprise. Uh, that is a, that's a beauty one, man. I've never, I've never done that. I did, uh, I used to keep condoms in there because they would always, what's in the fanny pack? I'm just like, man, like pull out like a, <laughs> you know how they connect? Yeah. <laughs> Be like, like 12 condoms. Damn, got, oh, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, but you got a, a, like Renee Renee was born and there was no wife and kids. So it's a different time and, and you know. <laughs> and I wouldn't put it past Renee back then if he heard your friend's uh, idea. He would probably 100% do that. Kind of like the popcorn, put the hole in the bottom of the popcorn bag, right? Yeah, for the movie theater. I tell him that's, tell him, hey, he can, that, that, I hear fanny packs are hip all of a sudden. Jared Leto or someone's wearing it. It was on TMZ. What do you guys think about Riff Raff? What do you guys think about all that shit? I think I think Riff Raff's tight. I've seen I so I got to saw or I saw Riff Raff perform with Waka Flocka Flame. Oh wow! A couple months ago, and he he killed it. He really Waka killed it, but Riff Raff killed it too. Um, His brother Snowboard. I'm so down with the whole persona. I'm glad he's linked in with uh, or he has a close uh, connection with snowboarding with his brother Victor and and um, I'm super See, down. Was I wonder if he knew if he he his brother must know Renee Renee though. So I just wonder with the, yeah. the neon icon. I'm like, dude, come on! I was a neon icon before you were Riff Raff. <laughs> but that's just me. That's just me. I'm not. I'm, I don't even wear neon anymore. So I, I, I should just stop. <laughs> but I have met him. I've hung out with him, and he's he's a, a sweet character. You know, obviously I was not Renee Renee, and I was just mellow guy. Uh, and I went, we went to his apartment. Uh, I was hanging out with these, these buddies, the ATL twins. And, 
he this guy had like these white samurai swords. <laughs> like he's it's like I couldn't tell like I mean with myself I'm a, you know I I I Rene Rene is a character. I was like with this guy it's like dude I don't is is this an act? Like it was hard to it was hard to decipher. He's got to be a good act. Not, you He's got to be a good act. I consider him a performance artist. You do? Yeah, but I mean, I'm I don't know. I'm not sure. I think I think he's a really good performance artist. Isn't Dave into like setting up like MMA fights? Is this could could it be like Rene Rene versus Riff Raff? Like let's work this no. out in the ring. Well, Riff Raff is training for the WWE with Hulk Hogan. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so you never know. He might go to MMA, brother. <laughs> <laughs> brother. Oh man! Well, well I don't. Hey, I don't have any Canadian music to take us out with. I think you guys have have uh, tapped into every Canadian artist on on your podcast. Well, yeah, he hasn't played enough for an A so you're welcome. There we go. <laughs> I, that sex is hot. Sex is hot. <laughs> I can't thank you enough, man. This was purely radio gold, and uh, I'm I'm genuinely a fan. So I'm psyched on what you guys are doing, and uh, you know, just uh, really honored to have you on today. Yeah, no worries. Keep in touch. Let's have the original Neon Icon take us out with a track from his album, White Heat, called Sexcapades. Peace. Join me on my sex capades. I wanna take you higher than you've ever been, ever been. And I wanna show you life that always wins, always wins. Every girl in the whole wide world, stand up, sit down, shake your rope. Every lady acting crazy, hands up, lay down, move that butt. Every girl in the whole wide world, stand up, sit down, shake your rope. Every lady acting crazy, hands up, lay down, move that butt. you for listening to the not snowboarding podcast to hear more episodes go to www.notsnowboardingpodcast.com
Does that work? Yeah, that's great. Thank you what so was much. It again, though, I'll do a proper one. The, the not, not snowboarding podcast. The not snowboarding podcast. Okay. What's up? This is Jason Bothe, aka Renee Renee, and you're listening to the not snowboarding podcast. <laughs>